Chapter 21 Through the Turkish Lines in Disguise Nearly all Arabs carry some sort of good luck charm, and the belief in jinn or genie is still common. The talisman which Aouda wore around his neck was probably one of the most extraordinary to be found in all Arabia. The amulet was a diminutive copy of the Koran, about one inch square, for which he paid more than two hundred pounds. One day he displayed it with great pride, and Lawrence discovered it had been printed in Glasgow, and, according to the price marked inside the cover, had been issued at eighteen pence. So far as we could make out, the only things the Bedouins are afraid of are snakes, and they believe that the sole protection against them is such a charm worn round the neck. There are thousands of reptiles in certain parts of the desert. The worst snake belt in the Near East extends from Yauf to Azraq, along a chain of shallow wells in the North Arabian Desert, where one finds, usually near the water, Indian cobras, puff adders, black whip snakes, and hosts of others, nearly all deadly. Lawrence once started out on an expedition with eighteen men, five of whom died on the way from snake bite. Instead of relying on the usual alcoholic antidote, he, like his nomad companions, put his faith in Allah. In Arabia, a snake will often snuggle up to a sleeping Bedouin at night for warmth, but it will not bite, unless the sleeper is unlucky enough to roll over and frighten it. Although their consciences are by no means clear, nearly all Bedouins, fortunately, are sound sleepers. Whenever Lawrence and his men reconnoitered in the snake belt at night, they put on boots and were careful to beat every foot of ground and every bush in front of them. When an Arab is bitten, his friends read certain chapters of the Koran over him. If they happen to choose correct passages, he lives. But if they have no Koran, the unfortunate one in all likelihood dies. Tis the will of Allah. Although the Arabs knew Lawrence was a Christian, once he had gained their confidence, they often invited him to pray with them. This he did only when he felt inclined to humor them, but he had completely memorized all the important Mohammedan prayers so as to be prepared for any unforeseen emergency when his declining to pray might cause embarrassment to Amir Faisal and King Hussein in the presence of members of strange tribes. Fortunately, no such emergency ever arose. But when he did pray with his Bedouins on several occasions, just to please them, the procedure was as follows. Lawrence and his bodyguard would kneel on their prayer rugs with their faces toward Mecca. Then, with one of the sheikhs acting as leader, they would go through a ceremony consisting of rhythmic prostrations and the repetition, in unison, of passages from the Koran. A certain number of bows are made in the morning, so many at noon, and still a different number at sunset, although the words repeated each time are much the same. At the end of all prayers, Lawrence and his men would turn their heads to the right and then to the left before rising. Lawrence explained to me that two angels were supposed to be standing beside each person while praying. One angel records good deeds and the other bad deeds, and it is customary to salute them both. All good Muslims have five prayer services daily, but Lawrence and his men usually cut them down to three by telescoping two in the morning and two in the afternoon, Otherwise, the Arab army would have spent more time praying than fighting. Lawrence overcame the two greatest prejudices of the Bedouins, namely that he was a foreigner and a Christian. Most of the foreigners these nomads had met were Turks, whom they despised as barbarians, for the Arabs are intellectual snobs. The only Christians they know are the native Christians of the Syrian coast and the Armenians, who are more accustomed to show the other cheek than to show courage. The Arabs loathe them. It suited them for the most part to ignore the fact that Lawrence was a Christian, because they considered it a disgrace that any Christian should outdo them at the very things at which they ordinarily excel. Occasionally, however, they actually invited him to recite his Christian prayers aloud, which he did most eloquently. Charles M. Doughty, the traveler and poet, so far as I know, was the only man other than Lawrence who ever wandered openly up and down Holy Arabia as a Christian. All other explorers in the forbidden country of the Prophet have disguised themselves as Muslims. Doubt he had at least a score of narrow escapes from death, and that he escaped at all was due to the fact that he always went unarmed and did nothing covertly. He took no money with him, and made his way about by healing the sick with simple remedies, and by vaccinating Arabs. An old man and a great scholar, he now lives at a watering place on the south coast of England. He and Lawrence are close friends, and the younger man gives his predecessor full credit for 
breaking the ice and making it possible for him and his associates to work with the Bedouins during the war. In fact, Doughty's Arabia Deserta was both Lawrence Bible and military textbook during the campaign. The magnificent Bedouin clothes that Lawrence wore were not theatrical garb. They were a part of his carefully worked out plan to gain complete mastery over the Arabs. Although he did not attempt to disguise either his religion or nationality, outwardly he was an Arab. Except in certain areas, he found that being known as a British officer and a Christian was less of a hindrance than full disguise. Had he desired to pass himself off as a Bedouin, he would have had to grow a beard, a feat he could not have achieved even if the fate of the British Empire depended on it. However, on a few occasions he did disguise himself as a Bedouin woman who made his way through the Turkish lines. But to other British officers who desired to visit a tribe, he recommended simply the Arab headcloth to be worn out of courtesy and not as a disguise. Bedouins have a malignant prejudice against the hat and believe our persistence in wearing it is founded on some irreligious principle. If you were to wear this season's smartest Piccadilly Derby or Austrian velour in Mecca, your friends and relatives would disown you. Adopt the Kufia, Agal, and Abba, and you will acquire the confidence and intimacy of the sons of Ishmael to a degree impossible in European garb, was the Lawrence maxim. But to don Arab kit was, has its dangers as well as its advantages. Breaches of etiquette, excused in a foreigner, are not condoned if he's in Arab clothes. You are like an English actor appearing for the first time in a German theater. Even that is not a parallel, because you are playing a part day and night, and for an anxious stake. Complete success comes when the Arab forgets your strangeness and speaks naturally before you. So far as I know, Colonel Lawrence is the only European who has ever accepted by the Arabs as one of themselves. His advice was that if you wear Arab dress, you should always wear the vest, for the reason that clothes are significant among the tribes. Dress like a Sharif if the people agree to it, and if you use Arab costume at all, go the whole length. Leave your English friends and customs on the coast, and rely entirely on Arab habits. If you can surpass the Arabs, you have taken an immense stride toward complete success. But the effort of living and thinking a foreign language, the rude fare, strange clothes, and stranger ways, with the complete loss of privacy and quiet, and the impossibility of ever relaxing your watchful imitation of others for months on end, prove such an added strain that this course should not be taken without serious thought. Whenever Colonel Lawrence was not engaged in conducting major military operations or planting tulips along the Hijar Railway, he would disguise himself as an outcast Arab woman and slip through the enemy lines. This was the best disguise for a spy, for the Turkish sentinels usually considered it beneath their dignity to say, Stop! Who goes there? to a woman. Time and again he penetrated hundreds of miles into enemy territory, where he obtained much of the data which finally enabled Field Marshal Halabi's Palestine army and Emir Faisal's Arabian forces to overwhelm the Turks in the most dazzling and brilliant cavalry operation in history. Lawrence once had a spare fortnight in which to make things lively for the Turks while he was waiting for Auda Abu Tayy to assemble his Hawatat warriors, occupied by a lone Bedouin of the Anaza tribe named Dami. He passed through the Turkish lines in his customary female disguise and made his way toward Palmyra, where he hoped to find an influential Bedouin sheik who was in sympathy with the Arabian revolt. This chief was a thousand miles away on the Euphrates, and so Lawrence and Dami turned their camels toward Baalbek. In the desert near that ancient Syrian city, famous for its ruined temples which rival the Acropolis at Athens, there is a tribe of semi-nomads, the Metawala, who were friendly to King Hussein and Demir Faisal, although they were compelled to cooperate with the Turks. Lawrence wanted to visit these Matawala to ensure himself of their assistance some months later when the final advance would be launched, and when he expected the Hijaz forces and Alambi's troops to push the Turks north through Syria. His plan was to arouse all the nomad tribes in Syria so that they would be constantly harassing the Turkish army from away from within their own lines. Two miles outside Baalbek, Lawrence slid down from his camel, took off his Arab costume, and swaggered boldly into the little town in the uniform of a British officer without insignia. 
At this time, Baalbek was still several hundred miles north of the line dividing Alibi's forces from the Turks. The British were only a few miles north of Jerusalem. The Turkish troops on the streets of Baalbek saluted Lawrence as though he had been a German officer, but there was nothing unusual in this, for if a Prussian officer of the Death's Head Hussars had passed Whitehall in London during the war, he no doubt would have received the salute of the House Guards. Lawrence's theory was that it was a much simpler matter to go boldly and openly in uniform in rural Turkey than to dodge about in a suspicious manner. After hurriedly glancing over the fortifications around Baalbek, Lawrence attempted to visit the Turkish military school where thousands of young officers were being trained. But when he reached the gates, he observed that officers barred the way, and so he decided it would be safer to retreat without exacting a salute. Resuming his disguise, Lawrence went on to the tents of the Metawala, where he pulled aside his veil and revealed his identity. The sheiks gathered around the new English prince of Mecca and clambered for a Syrian revolution at once. Lawrence explained that the time was not yet ripe, and tried to encourage them to future action by glowing accounts of the victories farther south in the Hijaz. However, he found the Metawala so keen for a raid or a lark of some kind that he was prevailed upon to join them in what he always referred to as a cinema show. In his contact with the peoples of the desert, he made the discovery that noise is one of the best forms of propaganda. So that night, followed by every able-bodied man, woman, and child in the tribe, Lawrence went down to the main line of the Turkish railway, which runs from Constantinople and Aleppo through Baalbek to Beirut. He selected one of the largest steel and concrete bridges in the Near East as the object of the evening's diversion. After planting his tulips under both ends of the bridge and all its bastions, he carried an electric wire connecting all charges to the summit of a nearby hill which the people of the Mutawala were occupying as a grandstand. Then, at the psychological moment, he threw in the switch and sent the great bridge skyward in a mass of flame and smoke. The Mutawala were to the last man convinced of the might of the allies and swore oaths by Allah, the Most High, and by the Holy Koran that they would join King Hussein's faithful. From here, Lawrence and his solitary Bedouin companions trekked across Syria to Damascus. They rode through the bazaars by night to the palace of Ali Riza Pasha, who was acting as military governor for the Turks. Ali Raza, although one of the Sultan's highest officials in Syria, secretly sympathized with the Arabian nationalist movement. That evening at dinner, over innumerable cups of sweetened coffee, Ali Riza informed Lawrence that the growing dissension between the Turkish and German officials would assure the ultimate success of the Allies in Palestine and Arabia. The Germans had become so high and mighty in their own estimation that they were treating the Turks like dogs. Consequently, feeling against the Germans had become so bitter that whenever the German general staff gave an order, the Turks would do their best to prevent its execution. According to Ali Riza, Falkenhayn, a few weeks previously, had advised the Turks to abandon both Palestine and Arabia, and retire to a line across Syria to the Mediterranean from Daraa, the important railway junction south of Damascus. The German field marshal had given the Turks sound and valuable advice, but the latter were as reluctant to accept it as they were to accept Field Marshal Falkenhayn himself as their commander-in-chief. As a result of their having spurned his counsel, they were so overwhelmed later by the combined British and Arabian forces that they not only lost all the region which Falkenhayn had advised them to abandon, but they also lost the city of Damascus and the entire territory of Syria, which they otherwise might have saved. After a bountiful dinner, and this illuminating interview with the Ottoman governor of Damascus, Lawrence and Dami slipped into the desert and made their way south into the Haran, the country of the Druses, a people who pitched their tents around a high mountain called Jebel Dru. The Druses owe much of their tribal solidarity to their peculiar religion, which is a secret faith built up around the worship of Hakim, a mad sultan of Egypt of the Middle Ages. The Turks have always had great difficulty in getting this quarrelsome independent tribe to recognize Ottoman authority or pay taxes to the Sultan. Most of the desert Arabs have carried on perpetual blood feuds with them, but Lawrence called their chieftains together, and with his inimitable gift for winning friends, succeeding in convincing them that they should wear, swear allegiance to Faisal and hold themselves ready to cooperate with his army when it approached Damascus. There would have been no quarter for Lawrence had he made a single false step. With his companion Dami and Talal, a Bedouin sheik known to the far corners of Arabia, 
He rode all around Damascus, Dara and the Haran, making a reconnaissance of the Turkish lines of defense. He explored the Turkish railway on three sides of the junction at Dara and took a mental note of important points in the lines north, south, and west of the junction, which it would be necessary for him to cut when he made his ultimate advance against Damascus. All this was walking right into danger, and only the perfection of his disguise and his command of the dialects of the country saved him from being suspected by the Turks and shot as an ordinary spy. He had one extremely narrow escape. When strolling nonchalantly along the streets of Dara, dressed as Sheikh Talal's son, two soldiers of the Sultan's army stopped him at a bazaar and arrested him on the charge of being a deserter from the Turkish army. Every able-bodied Arab in the Ottoman Empire was supposed to be under arms. They took him to headquarters and flogged him until he fainted. Then they threw him out more dead than alive and fearfully bruised. Some time later he regained consciousness and, barely able to crawl, made his escape under cover of night. Masquerading as a woman also entailed many difficulties. At Amman, in the hills of Moab, east of the Jordan, Lawrence went through the Turkish lines disguised as a Bedouin gypsy. He spent the afternoon prowling about the defenses surrounding the railway station, and after deciding that it would be futile for his Arabs to attempt to capture it on account of the size of the garrison and the strength of the artillery, he started toward the desert. A party of Turkish soldiers who had been looking with favorable eyes at the Bedouin woman started in hot pursuit. For more than a mile they followed Lawrence, trying to flirt with him and jeering at him when he repulsed their advances. One of the most important Turkish strongholds on the border of the Arabian desert was the town of Kerak, near the south end of the Dead Sea. One night Lawrence, disguised as a Bedouin, went through the Turkish lines with Sheikh Trad ibn Nuers of the Beni Sakir tribe, and found that there happened to be only three hundred Turks in the garrison at the moment. Lawrence and the Sheikh banqueted that evening with one of Trad's Kerak friends. In honor of the distinguished visitors, the Arab villagers dragged sheep and goats into the streets, built large fires, and feasted and circled in wild war dance until the witching hour. The members of the Turkish garrison were so frightened by this bold demonstration that they locked themselves in their barracks. After the celebration, Lawrence and his companion left Karak and returned to Aqaba. The result of this unimportant little episode was that 2,000 more Turkish troops were withdrawn from the forces opposing Allenby in Palestine and sent down to Karak. Lawrence had attained the two objects that he had in mind in making this extended and adventurous tour of enemy territory. He had spread broadcast propaganda for the cause of Arabian nationalism among the tribes that were still under Turkish jurisdiction, and he had obtained information enough to fill a book regarding the plans of the German high command. He went over the territory behind the Turkish lines so thoroughly that during the final drive of the campaign, he knew that part of the country almost as intimately as the Turks themselves. Chapter 22 The Greatest Hoax Since the Trojan Horse With the capture of the ancient seaport of Aqaba, which transformed the Sharifid revolt into an invasion of Syria, and with the official recognition of the Hijar army as the right wing of Allenby's forces, it became imperative that all Lawrence movements should fit in with Allenby's plans. Alibi by this time was in possession of all southern Palestine up to a zigzag line extending across the country from the Jordan Valley to the shores of the Mediterranean just south of Mount Carmel, the peak which since earliest times has been known as the Mountain of God. His first drive in the autumn of 1917 had resulted in the liberation of Beersheba, the ancient home of Abraham and Lot of Gaza, the capital of the Philistines where Samson was betrayed by Delilah, and of Hebron where Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, and Rebekah were buried in the cave of Machpelah, and it also resulted in the deliverance of Jaffa, the chief port of Palestine since the days of David and Solomon three thousand years ago, of the plains of Philistia and the plains of Sharon, and, more important still, had resulted in the liberation of the sacred cities of Bethlehem and Jerusalem from the Ottoman yoke. But the ancient land of Samaria, the city of Nazareth, and all Galilee, the coastal plain of northern Palestine and all of Syria still remained in the hands of the Turks, so that the campaign was only half completed. There were now two courses open to Allenby, either to push the Turks north by degrees, or to crush Turkish power in the east with one sweeping blow. The commander-in-chief elected to take the big risk, and he chose the latter. He decided to launch his final attack of Jaffa and Jerusalem in July 1918, 
But in June, when Ludendorff was making his last drive toward Paris and the Channel ports, the Allies were so hard-pressed in Western Europe that they were compelled to call upon Allenby to send many of his divisions to reinforce them in France. This completely disrupted all Allenby's plans. It now became necessary for him to create a new army. The unexpected necessity for a complete reconstruction of the forces on the Holy Land was a staggering blow. But England's modern Cour de Lyon was not in the least disheartened and immediately set to work to form a new army made largely of Indian divisions from Mesopotamia, hitherto untried in the war, and from his veteran Anzac cavalry under light horse Harry Chavel, the Australian general whom he had placed in command of the largest body of mounted troops that ever participated in modern warfare. Instead of attacking the Turks in northern Palestine in June or July, it now seemed impossible for him to launch his final thunderbolt before October or November. Lawrence was convinced that such a long delay would make it difficult for him to give much assistance on the right flank. By then, his rest of Bedouins would be wanting to migrate with their flocks to the winter pastures in the central Arabian plateaus, and in addition, his many years' experience in the country led him to believe that autumn rains would impede any military operation attempted during that season. He explained this to the commander-in-chief, who immediately grasped the situation and by superhuman effort whipped his new army into shape so that his new divisions were ready to take the field within eight weeks from the date of their arrival from Mesopotamia. Toward the end of August, he dispatched an aeroplane to Arabia with a welcome message for Lawrence, the announcement that he would be ready for a joint attack early in September instead of October or November. Allenby, fully aware of the inexperience of most of his new troops, realized that the Turks would have to be defeated by strategy rather than by force, so he decided to dupe the Turks with a colossal hoax, a sort of moving picture of the British army pushing straight up along the Jordan River from the Dead Sea toward Galilee. But it was to be a bogus army. In preparing this hoax, Allenby's first move was to shift all his camel hospitals from southern Palestine to the Jordan Valley within 15 miles of the Turkish lines. Next, he had hundreds of condemned and worn-out tents shipped up over the milk and honey railway from Egypt and pitched them on the banks of the Jordan. Then he hauled all his captured Turkish cannons down into the Jordan Valley and started them blazing away in the direction of the Turks encamped in the hills of Moab. Ten thousand horse blankets were thrown over bushes in the valley and tied up to look like horse lines. Five new pontoon bridges were flung over the river. The sacred valley of the Jordan was filled with all the properties for a sham battle of the ages. Never since the Greeks captured Troy with their famous wooden horse has such a remarkable bit of camouflage been put over on a credulous army. When the German reconnaissance aeroplanes flew over the Jordan, they buzzed back to Turkish headquarters with the important news that Allenby had placed two new divisions in the sector, this camouflage army arranged largely by General Bartholomew of Allenby's staff, was so realistic that the Germans and Turks never dreamed that it might all be a fake. And fortunately, the lines were so carefully guarded that not a single German or Turkish spy got through. Lawrence also sent a little helping hand in duping the Turks. Shortly before the date arranged for the big push, 300 members of the Imperial Camel Corps came down from Palestine to help him. They were under the command of Colonel Robin Buxton, a born soldier who before the war was a prominent Lombard Street banker. Under the guidance of his tent mate, Major W.E. Marshall, RAMC, fighting bacteriologist, Lawrence sent the Camel Corps to attack an important Turkish garrison at Mudawara, where a spectacular 20-minute battle was fought on August 8th. After the Battle of Mudawara, Lawrence led a combined force of Camel Corps and Arabs against Amman, just east of the Jordan. This was merely a feint, but it confirmed the Turks in the belief that the valley of the historic Jordan River was swarming with the bulk of Allenby's forces. Lawrence sent one of the most prominent chiefs of the Beni Sakir toward Damascus with 7,000 pounds in gold to buy barley. The sheik bought recklessly in every town and village on the eastern border of Syria. The Turks, knowing well that Amir Faisal's Bedouin cavalry could not use such vast quantities of grain, immediately decided that the barley must be intended for Allenby's forces in the Jordan Valley. Lawrence also started the rumor through the Arab army that Amir Faisal's host intended to launch its main attack against the Ra railway junction between Amman and Damascus. As a matter of fact, Lawrence remarked, we had every intention of attacking Dara, 
but we spread the news so far and wide that the Turks refused to believe it. Then in deadly secrecy we confided to a chosen few in the inner circle that we really were going to concentrate all of our forces against Amman. But we were not. This secret, of course, leaked out and was betrayed to the Turks, who immediately shifted the greater part of their forces to the vicinity of Amman, exactly as Allenby and Lawrence had planned. When the advance of the Arab army actually started, none but Amir Faisal, Colonel Joyce, and Colonel Lawrence knew that the attack was to center on Dara. Early in September, Lawrence started north of the head of the Gulf of Aqaba to help Allenby in his historic final drive, but instead of taking his Bedouin followers from the Hijaz, with the exception of his personal bodyguard, Lawrence recruited a new army from the tribes of the North Arabian Desert, and Joyce kept adding to his rapidly increasing mob of deserters from the Turkish ranks. When it started up the Wadi Araba from the head of the Gulf of Aqaba, Lawrence's caravan consisted of 2,000 baggage camels, 450 Arab regulars mounted on racing camels, four Arab machine gun units, two aeroplanes, three Rolls Royce armored cars, a demolition company of picked men from the Egyptian Camel Corps, a battalion of Gurkhas from India mounted on tall camels from the Sin Desert, and four mountain guns manned by French Algerians. In addition, he had his resplendent private bodyguard of 100 picked Bedouins. His total force amounted to 1,000 men mounted on camels. Lawrence's motto on this expedition, as on all others, was, No margin! He faced a march of 500 miles across unmapped desert under stupendous transport conditions. During one stage, they marched four days from one waterhole to another, carrying their entire water supply with them and suffering from thirst. When they reached the new water hole, they drank copiously, only to discover that the water was filled with leeches. These leeches fastened themselves on the inside of their nasal membranes and proved most painful. But the column made the trek in a fortnight. They were hurrying north to cut three Turkish railway lines and haul the telegraph wires around Dara, Lawrence's primary mission being to prevent the Turks from communicating with Damascus, Aleppo, and Constantinople when Allenby started his advance. The camouflage army of the Jordan was a complete success. As a matter of fact, there were only three battalions of able-bodied troops in that part of the Holy Land, two of which were made up of newly arrived Jewish troops from the British Isles and the United States. If the Turks had known the truth, they might have sent down one brigade, pushed up behind Allenby's lines, and recaptured Jerusalem. Allenby was taking enormous chances, but great men usually do. The commander-in-chief supplied his troops in the Jordan Valley with but three weeks' rations in order that they might use all of the transport for his main army. His supply people were frantic. They said the troops along the Jordan must be given eight weeks' food, but Allenby knew he was perfectly safe so long as his plan for one smash went through without a hitch. Allenby felt it would not be safe to engage the Turks in a decisive pitched battle with a brand new army. He had not had time to complete his work of reorganization, so his sole object was to hoodwink the Turks by luring them to the wrong place, the Jordan Valley, thus leaving a vulnerable stretch over near the Mediterranean. Allenby's sham attack down near Jericho had been scheduled for September 18. The British Intelligence Corps carefully allowed this secret to get out, and of course the Turks were ready to meet it. Allenby's real attack was made not on the 18th, but on the 19th, and when they woke up and discovered how they had been fooled, the war in the Near East was over, and most of them were British or Arab prisoners. Furthermore, it was not in the Jordan Valley, but away on the other side of Palestine to the north of Jaffa on the Mediterranean coast. He had transferred nearly all of his infantry and cavalry there by night, and they remained concealed in the orange groves until the day of the real battle. The battle that broke the backbone of the Ottoman Empire. Chapter 23 a cavalry naval engagement, and Lawrence's last great raid. All the Turkish ammunition and food had to be brought down from northern Syria over the Damascus-Palestine-Amman-Medina railway. Lawrence's plan was to swing way out across the unmapped sea of sand, and get clear around the eastern end of the Turkish lines, unexpectedly appear out of the desert, and dash up behind the Turks, and cut all their communication round Dura. One of Lawrence's most difficult problems during this maneuver was to keep his columns supplied. Even his armored cars and aeroplanes could not carry enough petrol to pull through. From Aqaba to the oasis of Azarak is 290 miles across burning desert. 
There were wells at only three places where the camels could be watered, and the little band had to live from hand to mouth. On its way, the column rested at Tefila, a village of 6,000 inhabitants, near which the most unusual episode of the whole campaign had taken place. A body of Bedouin horse under Abu Yagveg of Beersheba, under cover of darkness, rose up to a small enemy naval base near the southern end of the Dead Sea, not far from the ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The so-called Turkish Dead Sea Fleet, consisting of a few ancient arcs and motor-driven craft armed with light guns, was moored along shore. The officers were having breakfast in a Turkish army mess nearby, utterly unaware of the approach of a hostile force. Abu Irgig saw at a glance that the decks were deserted except for a few centuries, so he ordered his followers to dismount. With a rush, they clambered on board like Barbary corsairs, scuppered the crews, scuttled the boats, remounted their snorting thoroughbreds, and vanished at the desert haze before the day's Turks had time to realize what had happened. This is perhaps the only occasion in history in which a naval engagement has been won by cavalry. Lawrence's original plan was to gather under his standards the enormous Rurala tribe, which fills a large part of the North Arabian desert, and then to send in force upon the Haran hill country to make a direct assault on Dara. This came to naught because of a little difference which unexpectedly arose between King Hussein and General Jaffer Pasha and the senior officers of the Northern Army, which ruffled the temper of an important part of Lawrence's forces. By the time harmony had been restored, it was too late. As a result, the Ruala never came together, making it necessary for Lawrence to modify his scheme. In the end, he decided to carry out a flying attack on the railways northwest and south of Dara with his regular troops, assisted only by the wild druses of the Haran and a handful of the Ruala horse under Sheikhs Khalid and Trad Chalan. Before starting this attack, Lawrence arranged for another feint to be made on the 18th against Amman and Assault and for this purpose he sent word to the members of the Beni Sakir tribe to mass in the desert near Amman. The rumor of this, confirmed by Allenby's mobilization of his great camouflage army in the Jordan Valley, kept the eyes of the Turks fixed constantly on the Jordan, instead of on the Mediterranean coastal region to the north of Jaffa. On the oasis of Azarak is a magnificent old castle that dates from somewhere between the 6th and 14th centuries, and is turreted and loopholed like the fortress of a Scottish baron. Evidently it was an outpost of the far-flung Roman Empire, for Colonel R. V. Buxton of the Imperial Camel Corps found a carved stone in the ruins on which there was an inscription stating that two legions of Antoninus Pius had been there. So far as is known, no other force visited it until Lawrence and his men came. The Arabs refused to go near it because they say it's haunted by the mad hunting dogs of the shepherd kings that prowl round it a nights. Lawrence at one time thought he would like to retire here and make Azarak Castle his home after the war. On the 13th, Lawrence, accompanied by the small but mobile force which he had organized for his big attack on Dara, left the oasis of Azarak and marched into the assault foothills. Two days later they arrived at Umtaya, 13 miles southeast of Dara, where the male population of nearly all the villages of the Harhan joined the Sharifian army in a body. Among them was Sheikh Talal el Haredin of Tafa, the finest fighter in the Haran, who had accompanied Lawrence on some of his spying expeditions behind the Turkish lines. He acted as guide for the expedition from this point, and sponsored Lawrence's cause in every village. Lawrence declared that if it had not been for this man's courage, energy, and honesty, some of the tribes of the country through which they passed, who were blood enemies of King Hussein and Amir Faisal, might easily have wrecked all their plans. Probably twenty or thirty thousand Arab villagers and nomads joined Lawrence at different points of this grand finale of the Near Eastern campaign. In addition to severing the lines of communication, it was Lawrence's intention to place himself and his troops between the vital railway junction of Dara and the Turkish armies in Palestine, so as to lure the enemy into reinforcing the thus isolated garrison of Dara with troops from the Palestine front to otherwise would be free to help stem Allenby's advance. At the same moment, it was also necessary for Lawrence to cut the railway to the south and west of Dara in order to add color to the belief of the enemy that the entire Allied attack was coming against the Turkish Fourth Army in the upper Jordan Valley. The only unit available for putting the railway out of business consisted of the armored cars. The cars, plus Lawrence, 
whizzed gloriously down the railway line and captured one post before the open-mouthed Turks were aware of the danger. And this post commanded an attractive railway bridge, 149 kilos south of Damascus, on which was inscribed a flattering dedication of the bridge to hold up to Ul Hamid, the Red Sultan. Lawrence planted tulips containing 150 pounds of gun cotton at both ends and in the center, and when he touched them off, the bridge faded away on the autumn breeze. This job completed. The car started on again at top speed, but became stranded in the sand, where they were delayed for several hours. On their way back to rejoin the army in the Haran, they crossed the railway bridge, a railway five miles north of Dara, where Lawrence suppressed another post, wiped out a Kurdish cavalry detachment, blew up another bridge, and ripped up six hundred pairs of rails. After blowing up enough of the railway in the vicinity of Dara to throw the whole Turkish service of supply into complete chaos, Lawrence and his men ascended a high promontory called Mount Tel Ra, which commanded a panoramic view of Dara four miles away. Through his field glasses he made out nine planes in the enemy's aerodrome. During that morning the German aviators had had it all their own way in the air. They had been playing mischief with Lawrence's troops by dropping their eggs and breaking the Arabs with their machine guns. The Sharifian forces tried to defend themselves from the ground with their light artillery, but they were getting the worst of it until Lawrence won surviving machine. An antiquated old bus piloted by Captain Juner came trundling up from Arzark and sailed square to the middle of the whole German squadron. Lawrence and his followers watched this fracas with mixed feelings, for each of the four enemy two-seaters and four scout planes was more than the equal of the one prehistoric British machine. With both skill and good luck, Captain Juner cruised right through the German birdmen and led the whole circus off to the westward. Twenty minutes later, the plucky Juner came tearing back through the air with his attendant swarm of enemy planes and signaled down to Lawrence that he'd run out of petrol. He landed within fifty yards of the Arab column, and his B.E. flopped over on its back. A German Haberstad dived on it at once and scored a direct hit with a bomb that blew the little British machine into bits. Fortunately, Juner had jumped out of the seat just a moment before. The only part of his B.E. that was not destroyed was the Lewis machine gun. Within half an hour, the plucky pilot had transferred it to a Ford truck and was tearing around outside Dura, raking the Turks with his tracer bullets. Meanwhile, Lawrence dashed off to join the detachment of troops he had sent on in the direction of Mezrib. An hour after reaching it, he helped them cut the main Turkish telegraph lines between Palestine and Syria. It would be difficult to overestimate the importance of this, because it completely cut the Turkish armies off from all hope of relief from northern Syria and Turkey proper. At Mezrib, several thousand more natives of the Haran joined the Arab forces, and the following day Lawrence and his column marched on along the railway toward Palestine, right into the heart of the Turkish back area. They spent most of that day planting tulips, and near Nazib Lawrence blew up his 79th bridge, a rather large one with three fine arches, thus bringing to a close his long and successful career of demolition at 79. Knowing it might be his last, he planted twice as many tulips under it as necessary. The column slept soundly at Nasib on the night of the 18th after a good day's work. The next morning, bright and early, Lawrence marched his camels, horses, and Arabs off to Umtaya, where he was joined by the armored cars. During the morning, another enemy aerodrome was sighted near the railway, and Lawrence, with two of the armored cars, sped across open country for a near view. They found three German two-seaters in front of the hangars. Had it not been for a deep gully intervening, the two armored cars would have rushed them. As it was, two of the Germans took off and circled around like great birds, pouring streams of lead down the Rolls-Royce machines, while at the same time Lawrence and the crews inside the turrets finished the third aeroplane with 1,500 bullets. As the armored cars started back to Umtaya, the Germans swooped down on them four times, but all their bombs were badly placed, and the cars escaped unhurt, except for a bit of shrapnel that wounded the colonel in his hand. Speaking of his impression of armored car work, Lawrence remarked that he considered it fighting deluxe. This same day, the Arab regulars under Jaffer Pasha and the armored cars and French detachment under Rolla Horse under Neri Shalon gave a fine account of themselves. 
Jaffer Pasha, who also slashed his way brilliantly through the engagement, comes of a rich and noble Baghdad family. His history is full of romantic vicissitudes. At the outbreak of the war, Jafar al Askari, as a general on the Turkish staff, was sent across in a submarine from Constantinople to North Africa to organize an uprising in the Sahara among the Senussi Arabs. He led the Senussi in their short but spectacular campaign against the British. In the first battle he defeated the British, the second battle was a draw, and in the third he was badly wounded, defeated, and captured by the Dorset Yeomanry at Agagia, near Solom, and imprisoned in the great citadel at Cairo. In trying to escape at the end of three months, he broke his ankle and was recaptured in the moat under the citadel. He was as fat as a barrel, full of the joy of life, and such a gentlemanly, likable fellow that a little later the British put him on parole and allowed him to wander about Cairo. Being an Arab himself, he sympathized with the Arab nationalist cause and one day asked his British captors to permit him to volunteer as a private with Faisal. His request was granted and he did such remarkable work that before many months had passed he had risen to the post of commander-in-chief of Faisal's regular army, which was composed mainly of deserters from the Turkish ranks who had known Jaffer as a general in Turkey. Jaffer Pasha had received the Kaiser's Iron Cross at the Dardanelles and the Turkish Crescent for his work in the Senussi campaign, and after he had been with the Arabs for a while he was made a commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George by the British. Allenby accorded him his last honor at the Ramla headquarters in Palestine. The guard of honor on this occasion was the same Dorset yeomanry that had captured the Pasha just a year before. Jaffer was tremendously pleased and amused at this subtle touch of humor on Allenby's part. Nuri Saeed, Jaffer Pasha's brother-in-law, played an equally brilliant part in the war. He was Amir Faisal's chief of staff and remained in this position when Faisal became king in Damascus and later in Baghdad. Like Jaffer, he had attended the Turkish Staff College. In the Balkan War, he was an aviator. Afterward, he acted as secretary of the Arab Officers Secret Society, which plotted to overthrow the Turks. He is reckless and loves a hot fight. In fact, the hotter the action, the cooler was Nuri Said. He was one of the few Arab townsmen whom the Bedouins admired and respected. All had gone well with the preliminary plans for Allenby's drive in Palestine. But until 24 hours before the attack was launched on the 19th, the commander-in-chief himself was not certain whether it was going to succeed or not. If the Turks and Germans had discovered his real plan and had not been deceived into thinking that both the British and Arabian forces were concentrating on Amman with the intention of attempting to push north up the Jordan Valley, and if the enemy had withdrawn its right wing only about halfway across Palestine from the Mediterranean coast and the river Auja to the hills of Samaria, which would merely have been a retirement of ten miles along the entire front, the Turks could have played safe, Allenby's whole blow would have been wasted, and Lawrence's brilliant operations around Dura would have been all in vain. Lawrence did not even have sufficient supplies to last his column for two extra days, so that failure would have been nothing short of a catastrophe for him. Of course, neither Allenby nor Lawrence would have suffered heavy losses, but... On the other hand, they would not have rung the curtain down on Arabia and Palestine so soon. The entire World War might have dragged on for several months longer, and an additional hundred thousand lives or more might have been sacrificed on the Western Front. But there were no ifs. The enemy walked into the prepared trap like lambs to the slaughter. Chapter 24 The Downfall of the Ottoman Empire on the whole, this last joint operation of the British and Arabian forces was one of the most marvelous pieces of staff planning in all military annals. It was a game of chess played by experts on an international board. Never before was there a similar campaign. It was a complete reversal of all Marcel Folk's principles. Allenby and Lawrence went back to the Napoleonic Wars, to the battles of the 18th century, when generals won by maneuver and strategy instead of by tactics, the term tactics referring to the science of handling men under fire. In this, the most brilliant and spectacular military operation in the world's history, Allenby and Lawrence lost only 450 men, although they completely annihilated the Turkish army, captured over 100,000 Turks, advanced more than 300 miles in less than a month, and broke the backbone of the Turkish Empire. 
Part of the credit should go to Brigadier General Bartholomew. Allenby is colossal. He needs a needle-sharp man to complete him. He had such an officer and strategist in General Bartholomew. Allenby's complete plan, which involved the destruction of all the Turkish effectives with one sweeping blow, was known only to four people. The Commander-in-Chief himself, his Chief of Staff, Major General Bowles, General Bartholomew, and Colonel Lawrence. Not even Amir Faisal or King Hussein knew what was going to happen. At five o'clock on the morning of September 18, 1917, General Bartholomew came to his office at headquarters in Ramla and anxiously said to the staff officer on duty, Has there been any change? No, the Turks are still there, replied the latter. Good, said Bartholomew. We will take at least 30,000 prisoners before this show is over. He did not dream that the Allied forces would capture three times 30,000 Turks. The deception of the enemy had been perfect in every detail. When Allenby's forces entered Nazareth, which had been the German and Turkish Palestine headquarters, they found papers indicating that the German High Command had been certain the attack would take place in the Jordan Valley. Field Marshal von Sanders had been taken in down to the last point. Meanwhile, Lawrence, Joyce, General Nuri, and their associates had received no news of what was going on in Palestine, but they were busy day and night demolishing sections of the railway. One night, Lord Winterton, who played an active part in this final stage of the desert campaign, went out on a demolition expedition and placed some thirty parties at work along the line. The Earl himself dashed about in the dark from point to point in an armored car. While walking among the railway, he met a soldier who said, How are things? Fine, replied Winterton. We have twenty-eight charges planted, and we'll be ready to touch them off in a few minutes. The soldier remarked that this was splendid, and then disappeared. A moment later, machine guns blazed forth on all sides, and the Earl had to run for it. His questioner had either been a German or a Turk, and had the incident occurred an hour earlier, it might have spoiled Lord Winterton's work for that night. But the tulips were duly touched off, and the show was a success. The following day, Lawrence dashed back to Azraq in an armored car, then flew across the desert in northern Palestine to Allenby's headquarters at Ramla. A hurried conference with the commander-in-chief secured for him three more Bristol fighters, the best battle planes that the British were using in the Holy Land. He also brought back the astounding news that more than 20,000 prisoners had already been taken by Allenby's forces, that Nazareth, Noblis, and many other important centers had fallen, and that they were advancing toward Dara and Damascus. That meant that the Arabian army would be called upon by Allenby to play a still greater part from now on, because it was the only force between the crumbling Turkish divisions and Anatolia toward which they must retreat. Lawrence had flown to Palestine for airplanes because the Germans had nine of them near Dara, with which they were bombing Faisal's followers out of the ground. One of the pilots was a Captain Peters, and another was a Captain Ross Smith, who later became world famous and was knighted for flying from England to Australia. Lord Winterton gives us a graphic picture of the events of that morning in a scintillating article in Blackwoods. While Elle and the airmen were having breakfast with us, a Turkish plane was observed making straight for us. One of the airmen hurried off to down the intruder. This he successfully did, and the Turkish plane fell in flames near the railway. He then returned and finished his porridge, which had been kept hot for him meanwhile, but not for him a peaceful breakfast that morning. He had barely reached the marmalade stage when another Turkish plane appeared. Up hurried the Australian again, but that Turk was too wily and scuttled back to the raw, while to be chased by P on another machine, which sent him down in flames. That night the Germans burnt all of their remaining machines, and from that moment the British airmen had the air above North Arabia, Palestine, and Syria to themselves. That afternoon a giant Handley page arrived from Palestine with General Borden, commander of Allenby's air squadrons, as the passenger, and Ross Smith as the pilot. They brought forty-seven tins of petrol, and also a supply of tea for Lawrence, Winterton, and his companions. This was the first time that a great night bombing plane ever flew over the enemy lines by day. 
The purpose was for propaganda, and so profoundly were the tribes been impressed by this vast bird, which was several times larger than any they had thus far seen, that all of the peoples of the Haran, who had been reluctant to cooperate with Amir Faisal, immediately swore allegiance to the Arab gauze and galloped in on their horses with their rifles popping off into the air, eager to charge the Turks, or at least make a noisy display of valor. The next day, the infantry under General Jaffer Pasha, the jovial commander-in-chief of Colonel Joyce Regulars, went down to have a look at the first large bridge which Lawrence had dynamited in the vicinity of Dura. They found it nearly repaired, but after a sharp fight they drove off its guards, who were persistent and game German machine gunners, destroyed more of the line, and then proceeded to burn the great timber framework which had been erected by the Turks and Germans during the intervening seven days. In this rather sharp encounter, the armored cars, the French detachment under Captain Pisani, and the Ruala horse under Nuri Shalan plunged into the heart of things. Nuri is a quiet, retiring man of few words and plenty of deeds. He turned out to be unusually intelligent, well-informed, decisive, and full of quiet humor. Lawrence once remarked to me that he not only was the chief of the largest tribe in all the desert, but one of the finest Arab sheiks he'd ever met and that the members of his tribe were like wax in his hands because he knows what should be done and does it. When Lawrence started his operations around Dura, Von Sanders did exactly what his opponents wanted him to do. He sent his last reserves up to Dura, so that when Allenby's troops once smashed through the Turkish front lines, they had fairly clear going ahead of them. At the important railway junction of Afala, on the evening of the 19th, the Turkish motor lorries came streaming in for supplies, not knowing that all of their great depots were in the hands of Allenby's men. As they rumbled into the supply station, a British officer remarked politely to one and all, Would you mind going this way, please? That lasted for four hours, until the news spread through the Turkish back area that Allenby's troops had taken Afula, the railway junction in the center of the plain of Esdraelon, where the Turkish railway which connects Constantinople, Damascus, and the Holy Land branches out, one line extending down into Samaria, and the other cast to Haifa and on to the Mediterranean. Afala was the main supply base of the whole Turkish army. After Alibi had occupied Afala for fully six hours, a German plane came down with orders to von Sanders from Hindenburg. The occupants of the plane did not discover their predicament until they left their machine and walked over to local headquarters to report. To their chagrin, they found themselves turning over their orders to Alibi's staff. By September 24, Alibi's forces had advanced so far that the entire Turkish Fourth Army concentrated around Amman and the Jordan on the machine of uh, attacking empty tents and horse blankets, had been ordered back to defend Dura and Damascus. The Turkish Fourth Army generals were infuriated when they discovered that the railway line had been cut behind them and attempted to retreat north along their motor roads with all their guns and transport. Lawrence and his cavalry did not intend to pave their retreat with roses. Stationed on the hills, they poured down such an incessant stream of bullets that the Turks were forced to abandon all their guns and carts between Mafrak and Nasib. Hundreds were slaughtered. The formal column of retreat broke up into a confused mass of fugitives who never had a minute's peace to reform their lines, British aeroplanes adding the finishing touch by dropping bombs, and the Turkish Fourth Army scattered panic-stricken in all directions. Lawrence now decided to put himself between Dura and Damascus, hoping to force the immediate evacuation of Dura, and thus pick up the sorry fragments of the cracked Turkish Fourth Army as it emerged from Dura, and also harass other remnants of the Turkish armies in Palestine that might attempt to escape north. Accordingly, at the head of his Camel Corps, he made a hurried forced march northward on the 25th, and by the afternoon of the 26th swept down on the Turkish railway near Ghazale and Ezra on the road to Damascus, with him were Nasir, Nuri, Auda, and the Druses, names with which to hush children even in the daytime, to quote Lawrence himself. His rapid maneuvers took the panic-stricken Turks completely by surprise. Just the previous day they had worked feverishly on the railway line and had reopened it for traffic at the points where Lawrence had damaged it a week earlier. He planted a few hundred tulips, putting the line out of commission permanently, and penning six complete trains in Dura. Fantastic reports of disaster spread like wildfire throughout Syria, and the Turks at once began the evacuation of Dura by road. 
By dawn of the 27th, Lawrence and his cavalry were already out scouting the surrounding country and had captured two Austro-Turk machine gun companies placed across a road to oppose Allenby's approaching columns. Then Lawrence climbed to the summit of a high hill in the vicinity called Sheikh Saad, whence he would sweep the countryside with his glasses. Whenever he saw a small enemy column appearing on the horizon, he jumped on his horse and, accompanied by some nine hundred picked men, only too eager for that kind of diversion, charged into the midst of them as if they had been tin soldiers, and serenely took them all prisoners. If from his observation station on the hill he saw a column that was too large to tackle, he lay low and let it pass. About noon an aeroplane dropped Lawrence a message stating that two columns of Turks were advancing on him. One, six thousand strong, was coming from Dura, the other, two thousand strong, from Mazarib. Lawrence decided that the second was about his size, sending for some of his regulars who were gathering stray Turks like daisies a few miles away. He dashed off to intercept the enemy near Tafa. At the same time, he sent the Haran horsemen in the other direction to get around behind them and hang on the skirts of the column in order to annoy them. The Turks reached Tafa a short time before Lawrence and brutally mistreated all the women and children of the village. Sharif Bey, commander of the Turkish lancers at the rear guard of the column, ordered all the people massacred, including the women and children. Dalal, head sheik of this village of Tafa, who had been a great tower of strength with Lawrence from the beginning, and one of the boldest horsemen in North Arabia, was riding at the front of the Arab column with Lawrence and out of Haputai when he came upon the wives and children of his kinsmen lying in pools of blood in the road. Several years after the war, one of Lawrence's poet friends in England got married, and when Lawrence expressed regret at not having enough money to buy an appropriate wedding present, the poet suggested that he might let him have a few pages of his diary instead. The wish was granted, and the poet disposed of the pages to the world's work for publication in America. The portion sold happened to include Lawrence's story of the death of the gallant Sheikh Talal el Haredin. We left Abdelmain there and rode on past the other bodies, now seen clearly in the sunlight to be men, women, and four babies, toward the village whose loneliness was now meant that it was full of death and horror. On the outskirts were the low mud walls of some sheep folds, and on one lay something red and white. I looked nearer, and saw the body of a woman folded across it, face downward, nailed there by a saw bayonet whose haft stuck hideously into the air from between her naked legs. She had been pregnant, and about her were others, perhaps twenty in all, variously killed but laid out to accord with an obscene taste. The Zagi burst out in wild peals of laughter, in which some of those who were not sick joined hysterically. It was a sight near madness, the more desolate for the warm sunshine and the clean air of this unplanned afternoon. I said, The best of you brings me the most Turkish dead. And we turned and rode as fast as we might in the direction of the fading enemy. On our way we shot down those of them fallen out by the roadside who came imploring our pity. Talal had seen something of what we had seen. He gave one moan like a hurt animal, and then slowly rode to the higher ground and sat there a long while on his mare, shivering and looking fixedly after the Turks. I moved toward him to speak to him, but Howda caught my rein and stayed me. After some minutes, Talal very slowly drew his headcloth about his face and then seemed to take hold of himself for he dashed his stirrups into his horse's flanks and galloped headlong, bending low in the saddle and swaying as though he would fall straight at the main body of the enemy. It was a long ride, down the gentle slope and across the hollow, and we all sat there like stone while he rushed forward, the drumming of his horse's hooves sounding unnaturally loud in our ears. We had stopped shooting, and the Turks had stopped shooting both armies, waited for him. He flew on in this hushed evening, till he was only a few lengths from the enemy. Then he sat up in the saddle and cried his war cry, Talal! Talal! Twice in a tremendous voice. Instantly all their rifles and machine guns crashed out together, and he and his mare, riddled through and through with bullets, fell dead among their lance points. Out it looked very cold and grim. God give him mercy. We will take his price. 
He shook his rein and moved slowly forward after the enemy. We called up the peasantry, now all drunk with fear and blood, and sent them from this side and from that against the retreating column. How to led them like the old lion of battle that he is. By a skillful turn, he drove the enemy into bed, or into bad ground, and split their column into three parts. The third part, the smallest, was mostly made up of German and Austrian gunners, grouped round three motor cars which presumably carried high officers. They fought magnificently and drove off our attacks time and again, despite our desperation. The Arabs were fighting like devils, the sweat blinding our eyes, our throats parched with dust, and the agony of cruelty and revenge, which was burning in our bodies and twisting our hands about so we could hardly shoot. By my orders, they were to take no prisoners for the first time in the war. This account of the death of Jalal al Haradin of Tafa, in Lawrence's own words, shows us what marvelous descriptive powers this young soldier scholar has at his command, and gives us a hint of the masterpiece that the world should one day receive from his pen. Two German machine gun companies had resisted magnificently and escaped, with the Turkish commander in chief, Jamal Pasha, in his car in their midst. The Arabs wiped out the second section completely after a bitter hand to hand struggle. No prisoners were taken because the Arabs were wild with rage over the Tafa massacre. Two hundred and fifty German prisoners had been captured during the day, but when the Arabs discovered one of Lawrence's men with a fractured thigh pinned to the ground with two German bayonets, they acted like enraged bulls. Turning their machine guns on the remaining prisoners, they wiped them out. After the encounter, Nuri Shalon, at the head of the Rolla horse, rode straight into the main street of Dura. There were two or three fights on the way, but they took the town in a whirlwind gallop. The next morning, Nuri returned to Lawrence at Tafa with five hundred infantry prisoners and the freedom of the town of Dura. Some of Allenby's troops arrived in Dura that day also. Lawrence and his army spent that night, and a very uneasy night it was, on Sheikh Sa'ad Hill. He did not feel certain of victory, since there was always a risk of his small force being washed away by a great wave of the enemy in retreat. All that night the Haran horsemen clung tenaciously to the great Turkish column from Dura, made up of six thousand men, which Lawrence had not dared engage in pitched battle. Instead of sleeping with the regular troops at Sheikh Saad, Lawrence spent part of the night helping the Haran cavalry, and at dawn he rode off to the westward with a handful of men until he met the outposts of the 4th Cavalry Division of the British Army. After guiding them into Dura and starting them off on their northward march toward Damascus, Lawrence galloped back full speed to the Haran cavalry. Although the Turkish column, when it left Dura, was 6,000 strong, at the end of 24 hours only 5,000 remained. 1,000 had been picked off by the Bedouins, 18 hours more and there were 3,000, and after a point called Kizwa, where Lawrence headed off the remnant of the Turkish 4th Army and flung them into one of Allenby's cavalry brigades coming from the southwest, only 2,000 remained. In all, Lawrence, Joyce, Jaffer, and Nuri, and their scattered force of wild Bedouins and regular Camel Corps, had killed about 5,000 of the Turks in this last phase of the campaign, and captured more than 8,000, as well as 150 machine guns and 30 cannon. In addition to the column of less than 1,000 men who had started north from Aqaba with Lawrence, out of Abu Tayy, and 200 of the best fighting men of the Habitat tribe took part in Lawrence's war dance around Dura. Also, 2,000 Beni Sakir, the sons of hawks from east of the Dead Sea, 4,000 Urala under Nuri Shalan from the North Arabian Desert, 1,000 Druzes from the Horan, and 8,000 Arab villagers from the Horan. In a letter which he wrote to me more than a year after the war, Colonel Sterling, who had played a prominent role in this final raid, summed up the effects of what the Arabs had done to help Allenby overwhelm the Turks. This, after all, wrote Colonel Sterling, was the main justification of our existence and of the money and time we had spent in the Arab Revolt. The raid itself was really very dramatic in that we started out a small, regular force of Arabs, 400 strong, and marched 600 miles in 23 days through unmapped Arabia and came in out of the blue, miles behind the Turkish main armies, and as an absolute surprise. Two days before the British advance in Palestine began, we had cut three lines of railways and for five days allowed no trains to get through to the Turkish armies. 
The result was that when their retreat commenced, they found all their f advanced food depots and ammunition dumps were exhausted. During these days, we, of course, led a somewhat precarious existence, generally shifting camp twice in a night to avoid being surprised. We were only a very weak force then, you see, though by the time we got on and rushed Damascus, something like 11,000 mounted Arabs had joined us. Some of the Arab horsemen rode right on that evening into Damascus, where the burning ammunition dumps turned night into day. Back at Kizwa, just a few miles south of Damascus, and not far from where Saul of Tarsus was dazzled by the light that transformed him into Paul, the interpreter of Christianity, the glare of the fires from Damascus and the roar and reverberation of explosions kept Lawrence awake most of the night. He was completely worn out. From September 13 to 30, he had caught only occasional snatches of sleep, mounted on a racing camel or dashing about the country on an Arab steed, riding inside a turret of an armored car or flying about in one of the fighting planes. He had led the relentless existence demanded of him in this great emergency of the war. Now the end of the war was in sight in the land of the Arabian Nights. But sleep was difficult because all night long the Turks and Germans were blowing up their ammunition dumps eight miles north in Damascus. With each explosion, the earth shook, the sky went white, and splashes of red tore great gaps in the night as shells went off in the air. They're burning Damascus, Lawrence remarked to Sterling. Then he rolled over in the sand and fell asleep. Chapter 25 Lawrence rules in Damascus and the treachery of the Algerian emir. The next morning they saw Damascus in the center of its gardens as green and beautiful as any city in the world. The enchantment of the scene, like a dream that visits the light slumbers of the morning, a dream dreamed but to vanish, reminded Lawrence of the Arab story that when Muhammad first came here as a camel driver, upon seeing Damascus from a distance, he refused to enter, saying that man could only hope to enter paradise once. Coming out of the desert and beholding this view, than which there is none more enchanting and alluring in the world, it is no wonder Muhammad was sorely tempted and even trembled for his soul. Seen from afar, this oasis of verdure, rimmed round by yellow desert against a background of snow-capped mountains, is indeed a pearl in an emerald setting, so it is only natural that the desert dweller should look upon it as an earthly paradise. As the sun rays fell aslant, weaving a fairy gossamer veil over the minarets and cupolas of this dream city, Lawrence and Sterling drove into Damascus in their famous Rolls Royce, the Blue Mist. They went straight to the town hall, and there called a meeting of all the leading sheiks. Lawrence selected Shukri ibn Ayubi, a descendant of Saladin, to act as the first military governor under the new regime. Then he appointed a chief of police, a director of local transportation, and numerous other officials. These details arranged, Shukri, Nuri Said, Auda Abu Tahi, Nuri Shalan, and Lawrence, at the head of all their Bedouin irregulars, proceeded through the streets of Damascus. The 29-year-old commander-in-chief of the greatest army that had been raised in Arabia for five centuries, who in less than a year had made himself the most important man in Arabia since the days of the great caliph, Harun al-Rashid made his official entry into this ancient capital of the old Arabian Empire at seven o'clock on the morning of October 31st. The entire population, together with tens of thousands of Bedouins from the fringes of the desert, packed the street that is called Straight as Lawrence entered the gate, dressed in the garb of a prince of Mecca. All realized that at last their glorious city had been freed from the Turkish yoke, Howling dervishes ran in front of him, dancing and seeking knives into their flesh, while behind him came his flying column of picturesque Arabian knights. For months they had heard of the exploits of Sharif Lawrence, but now, for the first time, they saw the mysterious Englishman who had united the desert tribes and driven the Turks from Arabia. As they saw him come swinging along through the bazaars on the back of his camel, it seemed as though all the people of Damascus shouted his name and Faisal's in one joyful chorus. For ten miles and more along the streets of this, the oldest city in the world that still remained standing, the crowds gave the young Englishman one of the greatest ovations ever given to any man. 
Dr. John Finley of the American Red Cross, who came north with Allenby, said, in describing it, that there were scenes of joy and ecstasy such as may never be witnessed on this earth again. The bazaars were lined with hundreds of thousands of people. The street that is called Straight was so packed that the horses and camels could hardly squirm through. The housetops were crowded. The people hung priceless oriental carpets from their balconies and showered Lawrence and his companions with silken headcloths, flowers, and attar of roses. Fortunately for the Arabs, Allenby had ordered light horse Harry Chevelle to hold his Australians back and let Faisal's advance guard into the city first, and Allenby also had not given any arbitrary orders regarding the establishment of a temporary government in Damascus. Sir Lawrence was astute enough to see to it that representatives of the Arabian army entered just ahead of the British, thereby giving Amir Faisal first possession. Colonel Lawrence remained in Damascus only four days, but during that time he was the virtual ruler of the city, and one of his first moves was to visit the tomb of Saladin, where the Kaiser, back in 1898, had placed a satin flag and a bronze laurel wreath inscribed in Turkish and Arabic from one great emperor to another. The wreath and inscription adorned with a Prussian eagle had irritated Lawrence on his pre-war visits to Damascus, and early in the campaign, when they were far south at Yenbo, Lawrence and Faisal had vowed that they would not forget Saladin's tomb. The bronze wreath now adorns the office of the curator of the British War Museum, while the Kaiser's flag returned with me to America. During Lawrence's brief rule of Damascus, the kaleidoscopic bazaars of that most orthodox of all Oriental cities were seething with excitement. Only his intimate acquaintance with the personal caprices of the conspirators behind the innumerable intrigues and counter-intrigues made it possible for him to control the situation. Even then, there were thrilling incidents and danger from assassins. On November 2, a riot broke out in Damascus, a disturbance that might easily have blossomed into a counter-revolution. The moving spirit in it was an Algerian emir, one Abdel Kader, who had long been an arch-enemy of King Hussein and his sons. This blackguard was the grandson of the celebrated emir Abdel Kader, who for many years had fought the French in Algiers, and when finally defeated, had fled to Damascus. His two grandsons, Emir Muhammad Said and Emir Abdel Kader, planned an unsavory part of the war in the Near East. The former served as an agent of the Germans and Turks in Africa, where he extorted the Senussi of the Sahara to invade Egypt, while his younger and even more truculent brother, Abdel Kader, as a super spy for Enver Pasha, joined the Sharifian army. A mock escape from Constantinople gave Abdel Kader all the alibi needed for him to get out of the good graces of the Arabs, and when he arrived across the desert at Faisal's headquarters in Aqaba, he posed as an Arab nationalist. In fact, so plausible and eloquent was he, and so seemingly genuine were the promises of cooperation which he made, that even King Hussein welcomed him to Mecca, and gave him an honorary title. Then, when Allenby launched his first great drive which resulted in the capture of Beersheba, Gaza, Jerusalem, and Jericho, Lawrence was asked to cooperate by destroying an important railway bridge between the Turkish army and its Damascus base. It so happened that Abdel Kader was the feudal lord controlling much of the region round about the bridge, and when Faisal discussed the project with him, he at once begged to be allowed to take part in the raid. But after accompanying Lawrence on his trek north for many days, until the party was actually within a few miles of the bridge, Abdel Kader and his cavalcade of followers galloped off in the desert night and delivered the details of Lawrence's plan to the German and Turkish staff. Although this left him with only a few men, Lawrence nevertheless made a desperate, though unsuccessful, attempt to destroy the bridge, an adventure from which he barely escaped with his life. The Turks at first suspected the Algerian spy of double-crossing them and of really having turned pro-Arab, but they finally released him and then showered him with honors. Later on, when Allenby made his last great drive toward Damascus, Abdel Kader was sent among the Syrian villagers to cajole them into the remaining loyal to their Ottoman rulers. But when the cunning Algerian and his brother saw the Turkish retreat was degenerating into a debacle, their enthusiasm for their friends, Enver, Talat, and Jamal, vanished, and they galloped to Damascus several hours ahead of Allenby and Lawrence, hurriedly organized an Arab civil government with themselves as the heads, and prepared a triumphal welcome for their approaching British and Hajar armies. 
Naturally, they were a bit nonplussed to find the victors led by Colonel Lawrence, who peremptorily ordered them to resign, and then appointed men of Amir Faisal's choice in their stead. This so upset and enraged the intriguing brothers that they drew their weapons and would have attacked Lawrence had the others present at the council not disarmed them. Then these two unpleasant but immensely rich Algerian emirs collected together the members of their own personal bodyguard, who were mainly exiles like themselves, and paraded through the streets making impassioned speeches denouncing Amir Faisal and King Hussein as puppets of Lawrence and the British. They called upon the Damascenes to strike a blow for the faith and launch a new rebellion. Rioting soon broke out, and it took Lawrence men six hours to clear the town. The rioting soon deteriorated into pure looting, and it was necessary for Lawrence, General Nuri Pasha, Shukri Ayubi, and the other leaders of the Sharifian force to resort to machine gunning in the central square of Damascus and impose peace by force after killing and wounding a score or more. The two turbulent Algerian emirs managed to hide, and for a month they kept under cover while they planned a new rebellion. But Abdelkader's restless and impulsive spirit got the better of his discretion, and in a moment of passion he seized his rifle, leaped on his charger, and galloped down to Faisal's palace, shouting for Faisal to come out and fight him, and then started shooting. So persistent was he that one of the Arab sentries who had taken to cover sent a rifle ball through his head, and thus abruptly ended the adventures of the Algerian emir. After the fall of Damascus, the combined British and Arabian forces occupied the Syrian seaport of Beirut, where the famous American university is located that has done so much to inoculate the Near East with the spirit of democracy. Here an incident occurred that warned the Arabs of the diplomatic troubles ahead of them. As in the case of Damascus, the Sharifian forces, through the local people, took over the reins of government. But a few days later, a French representative, accompanied by a British officer, came along and demanded that the Arab flag be hauled down to the town hall so that the French tricolor could be raised in its stead. Whereupon the Arab governor laid his pistol on the table and said, There is my revolver. You may shoot me if you like, but I will not take down the flag. However, after another three days, Allenby wired that no flag at all should fly over Beirut and that a French officer should rule the city in the name of all the Allies. From that date, the Arabs had to fight an all-uphill battle on the field of diplomacy to keep from losing what they had fought for on the field of war. And once again, their champion was young Lawrence. From Beirut, the United British and Arab forces pushed on north to Baalbek, the City of the Sun, where in the days of the decline of the Roman Empire, men had erected the mightiest temple on earth, the columns of which still remain one of the wonders of the world. Still unsatisfied, Allenby's armored cars and Faisal's racing camelmen under the dashing Arab general, Nuri Sa uh, Said, swept on north until they had driven the Turks out of Aleppo, one of the most important strategical points in the east, so far as the Great War was concerned. And then, if the Turks had not put down their arms, they would have been driven north into the Golden Horn. When Allenby and Lawrence captured Damascus and Aleppo and then cut the Berlin to Baghdad railway, the dream of the Kaiser and the Junkers for a middle Europa reaching from the Baltic to the Persian Gulf vanished into thin air. When Turkey threw in her lot with the Kaiser, she asserted that she could mobilize an army of over a million men. But of that million, some 50% were of Arab stock, and from the outbreak of the Arabian Revolution to the final collapse of Turkey, it is estimated that approximately 400,000 of them deserted. The phenomenal number of desertions was due mainly to two factors, the Arab nationalist propaganda which Lawrence and his associates had spread throughout the Near East, and the brilliant success of the Arabian Revolution. In fact, the desertions alone more than repaid the Allies for backing the Sharifian cause. In our swift journey north from Aqaba to Aleppo with Lawrence, we have made no reference to the sacred city of Medina and the fate of the important Turkish garrison there. Although Holy Arabia was now no longer under Turkish rule, Ottoman forces still occupied the city famed for the tomb of the Prophet. To be sure, Faisal's brother, Emir Abdullah, had long kept it surrounded with an army, and indeed the fact that the Turks had managed to hold on to Medina had proved to be one of the blessings of Allah for the Arabs because of all the supplies required by the garrison being shipped down across the desert from Syria, 
and Lawrence had seen to it that a very considerable part of those supplies went to the Arabs instead of the intended destination. In fact, Lawrence's crop of tulips planted along the Damascus Medina Railway had brought forth a bountiful harvest of Turkish food supplies, ammunition, and other military stores. In explaining the reason for not driving the Turks out of Medina, writing in the army quarterly, Colonel Lawrence said, We were so weak physically that we could not let the metaphysical weapon rust unused. We had won a province when we had caught the civilians in it to die for our ideal of freedom. The presence or absence of the enemy was a secondary matter. These reasonings showed me that the idea of assaulting Medina, or even starving it quickly into surrender, was not in accord with our best strategy. We wanted the enemy to stay in Medina, and in every other harmless place, in the largest numbers. The factor of food would eventually confine him to the railways, but he was welcome to the Jah Railway, and the Transjordan Railway, and the Palestine, Damascus, and Aleppo Railways for the duration of the war, so long as he gave us the other 999 thousandths of the Arab world. If he showed a disposition to evacuate too soon, as a step to concentrating on the small area which his number would dominate effectively, then we would have to try and restore his confidence, not harshly, but by reducing our enterprises against him. Our ideal was to keep his railway just working, but only just, with the maximum of loss and discomfort to him. In fact, so little of what was sent down from Syria ever reached the garrison that for months prior to the armistice, this isolated Turkish force in Medina had been reduced to a diet of nothing but dates gathered from the palms for which the oasis is celebrated. Even the roofs of all the houses in the city had been torn down and used for fuel. But still the garrison would not give in, for the commander, Fakhri Adin, was a courageous, determined, stubborn, and fanatical general. Even when the news reached him that the combined British and Arab armies had captured Damascus and Aleppo, and the Turkish forces in Syria had been completely overwhelmed and compelled to sign an armistice, and even though Fakhri Pasha knew that it was futile for him to attempt to hold out any longer, since the war was all over and he and his garrison were isolated in the midst of the desert a thousand miles from Constantinople, still this Turkish tiger refused to acknowledge defeat. Days went by. And then weeks elapsed. The Medina garrison was now reduced to worse straits than the British at Kutalumara before the surrender of Townsend. Of the 20,000 men who had made up the defending force, less than 11,000 now remained. But still Fakhri Pasha swore in the Koran that rather than surrender to the Arabs and British, he would blow up the tomb of Mohammed and wipe out himself and all of his men. The British even guaranteed Fakhri that he and his troops would be protected from any possible rapacity of the Bedouin, but still the old tiger stood like adamant. His troops, however, were not so fanatical and longed to get back to their homes in Anatolia. So they finally mutinied, arrested their gallant commander-in-chief, and surrendered the city to Amir Abdullah's on January 10, 1919, months after the war was all over. Surely the name of General Fakhri Adin deserves a high place in Turkish history. For generations to come, Arab mothers of Medina will use it as a means of hushing their babes. After the dramatic surrender of Medina, Fakhri Pasha was no longer heard of in the Near East, and seemed to have completely vanished from the picture. But some time afterward, when we were traveling in little-known parts of Central Asia, I encountered the defender of Medina in the city of Kabul at the court of the Emir of Afghanistan. He apparently had lost none of his fire, and in his capacity of Turkish ambassador to the Afghans, was reported to be doing his utmost to keep the Emir of Afghanistan from becoming friendly with the British in India. If Turkey had a million fighting men with the fighting spirit of Fakhri Adin, she not only could regain all of her old provinces, but could conquer the Near East and build up an empire that would surpass the ancient glory of the great Mughals.